welcome everyone. My name is Jana Kulesha. I will have the honor and privilege of chairing the session on digital sovereignty, our second session during this 2021 GigaNet Symposium. Really excited and honored to meet my good friends and colleagues and meet some new friends and colleagues uh, during this session. Um, the focus of this panel is, as already noted, the digital sovereignty. We have five exciting papers. All of these can be accessed on the GigaNet website. We are joined by a good friend and colleague, uh, Claudio Lucena, who will be the discussant for these panels, following the impressive lead from previous session in this Zoom room, moderated and chaired by Co Courtney Rudge. I will encourage our panelists to present their papers within roughly eight minutes. Then I am going to kindly ask Claudio to discuss the papers, to give his feedback. And again, as was the case with the previous session, I will go back to our panelists for their immediate reactions with the approximate time of four minutes. We are under certain time constraints, so we will try to do just as well as the previous panel with regards to timing. We will be presented with five exciting papers. The first one, and I will hand the floor over directly to the authors, um, is on sovereignty in cyberspace with the, in itself, exciting subtopic of comparing EU and China. Without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to Ik Chan Chin. Uh, I believe you will be presenting the paper on behalf of both authors, if that is correct, Ik Chan Chin. It is my pleasure. Yes. Please take us away. Yes, thank you very much. And Joan. So I'm going to share my screen. All right. So today's um, my presentation is about the sovereignty in the cyberspace, China and the EU. So first of all, I would like to uh, talk about the research question. And basically, the research question is about uh, policy research on sovereignty and also the data sovereignty in cyberspace and uh, comparing the similarity and difference between the EU and China's policy. So the main argument is that uh, the policy difference between the EU and China on sovereignty is cyberspace, meaning focus on the positioning and the claims on the definition and the legalization of cyberspace sovereignty and the data sovereignty, as well as the difference uh, measures taken to support those claims. So it's not about the uh, substantive uh, difference, but it's more about the positioning and the claim and the definition and the measures to realize this uh, sovereignty. So that's the main argument. Okay, so if you look at uh, uh, the sovereignty, the concept of sovereignty, so basically sovereign, uh, the so sovereignty, the setup space is a close link to the global commons. So the argument is that the wider cyber space belongs to global commons. So that's the main argument. So basically there's a two different uh, approach, one's between the U uh, EU and the China. So basically EU and the US uh, think uh, cyberspace to belong to the global commons, which is beyond the jurisdiction of national boundary. And but China uh, does, doesn't uh, recognize the, uh, cyberspace as a global commons. So that is the, one of the main difference, okay? And the, those differences is also about a power struggle, uh, structure, uh, struggle between the different uh, interests. For example, the West, uh, West the long Western interests developing and the West developing countries interests. So uh, globally, if you look at the global uh, at the global level, especially uh, at the United Nations, the UN level, so the definition of the cyberspace actually is not a global commons, but it's more more about global public goods. So public, global public goods are different from global commons because the global commons is beyond the national, outside the national jurisdiction, but the global public goods is about the goods and the service provide to and the benefit of the society, but they still, they have the sovereignty. So that is the one thing I want to emphasize. So secondly, so when we talk about the cyberspace sovereignty, so there's a four different uh, dimension about uh, uh, cyberspace sovereignty, which is related to the national sovereignty. The first one is uh, modifies the uh, power uh, within its territory and also over its citizen. And secondly, is the equality of nation of nations in terms of the so sovereignty. And third one is uh, uh, the officials enjoying the immunity. You know, and this, uh, the last one is. A about a long intervention, a transition in terms of the uh, uh, national sovereignty. 
So there's a four different kind of the relations, uh, you can say theories, you know, which conceptualize the concept between the paper-based sovereignty and the national sovereignty. The first one is uh, against the national sovereignty should be determined by the, uh, should determine the cyber sovereignty, which proposed the uh, Muller, Milton Muller with uh, our friends. And uh, the second one is a talk about, uh, it is proposed by uh, other uh, academias and also UNCTE and, uh, uh, and the OWEG groups. So they have a published report. And also there's a new convention, you know, which proposed uh, recently by Russian, uh, which is called the United Nations Convention on the Use of Information Communication Technology and blah, blah, blah. So this is a draft uh, convention. So basically in those documents, policy documents, you can see that uh, uh, the principle of national sovereignty can be applied and it does apply to a country's cyber activities. So this is a second approach to link the concept of cyber sovereignty and national sovereignty. And the third approach is proposed by a group of the uh, Chinese uh, scholar and the think tanks. So basically their argument is that the cyberspace point sovereignty should be de developed on the basis of the national sovereignty. Uh, but in this, uh, the, in this conceptualization, they also have the uh, international perspective of the cyber sovereignties, which is overlapping with the, the third, the fourth approach, which is uh, talking about the minimum cyber uh, sovereign cyberspace and the cooperated sovereignty, which is talk about the sheer responsibility at the international level. So this is overlapping of the third approach. So we can see there's some overlapping between third and fourth. So in my research, I would like to see how those theories, you know, apply to these two different uh, regions, one is the EU and West China. So when we do the comparison, I mean, you look at the policy regulations and also the uh, government's official speech, you know, a media report. So the first the difference I found is about the governance model endorsed by the EU and China. So basically, in the EU, uh, the EU, uh, the EU promote a multi-stakeholder model based on long governmental control. So basically, uh, it's multi-stakeholder, it's equally participation. And the secondly, they want to have a, at a light, global level, they want to have a light, uh, long, long binding norms. And also they uh, want to keep the existing international law. But uh, for the tri if you look at the Chinese part and what they promote is a multilateral plural pluralism model. So which is a, uh, is a state led multi-party and multi-tier governance. And also they want to have a binding inter intergovernmental agreement. And also they want to have a new international rule, which, which has an equal input from all the states, not only a few states. And uh, so, so therefore we can see the similarities, both model, no matter it's multi-stakeholder or multi national pluralism, two models allow multiple actors to participate in internet governance. And uh, also they, both agree countries should agree to the UN Charter, which can should be applied to cyberspace. But difference is that the EU support a multi-stakeholder model, but China support a multilateral pluralism model. And the second di distinction is that uh, if we look at uh, how the um, the the the, the academia interview, uh, interpretation of those two models, so basically uh, most of uh, academia's interpret the multi-state multilateral pluralism model is a kind of the against the multi-stakeholder model. But the Chinese scholar actually think multilateral pluralism model is a variation of the multi-stakeholder model because they do not think they both is opposite to each other, but it's like a complementary to each other. So this, this is a second uh, uh, distinctions. And then also uh, there's a different criticism towards two models. So multi-stakeholder model was criticized uh, as a decentralized and lack of the accountability, but the multilateral pluralism model was criticized for uh, to serve the uh, maintain st stability or preventing unwan uh, unwanted content, content showed in internet. And the second, we look at the definition about the sovereignty and the measures endorsed by the EU and the China. So when, when they define what is the cyber sovereignty, the Chinese perspective, they have a two dimension. One, one is about a domestic dimension of the sovereignty, which is, you can see here, they have a four dimension, which is about jurisdictions, protections, and also safeguard and the independence. So this is a four dimension in terms of domestic sovereignty. Uh, and then the international sovereignty, they talk about the sovereignty equality, non-intervention and the non-undermining. 
So this is an international dimension in terms of Chinese definition, which is the government's definition, not the academic definition. If you look at the policy and the document, policy and the law. So if you look at the EU's definition, which is also from the EU's documents, okay? So basically they have a, a lot of the different definition, which is similar to the cyberspace sovereignty, like a strategical sovereignty, technological sovereignty, digital sovereignty, data product sovereignty, but their emphasis is more on the protected rights and the economical and the social development. And also, you know, talk about it, that have a be independence in terms of domestic uh, digital industries and also uh, ability to act independently in the digital world. So internationally, they emphasize the, not so much, but the meaning look at how do they uh, protect the individual interests and also domestic uh, uh, digital industries. But what they talk about, uh, uh, but also interestingly, we can, we can see in recent two years, many European countries like Netherlands, France, and Estonia start to you know, admit the internal and external aspect of sovereignty are fully applicable to the cyber domain. But the recent uh, study by the Chatham House uh, in, in London also says that many countries Many European countries they didn't public public publicize their view, but uh, uh, informally they agree this is also their view. So so there's no uh, dispute about the sovereignty should apply to uh, cyberspace, no matter it's in in the EU or in China. Okay, so if we look at the concept of data sovereignty, so the data sovereignty, which means the data should be bounded by the law and the governance structure of the country to collect or national state to subject data flow to national jurisdiction. So this is what we mean by data sovereignty. So there's uh, two theories about uh, data sovereignty. One is internal data sovereignty, external so data sovereignty. But this is proposed by Chinese academia. When they talk about internal data sovereignty, they talk about uh, the control of the internal infrastructure, data infrastructure and activities resource. But then when they talk about external data sovereignty, they more talk about uh, like a joint uh, international agreement in negotiation. And then, then there's a weak and a strong data sovereignty. We talk about the weak, strong, uh, weak so data sovereignty, which means is the industry-led initiative in protecting uh, personal rights. But then when we talk about strong data sovereignty, we mean the state-led uh, measures initiative to protect data security. So we have, when we talk about data sovereignty, I, we, I use these two dimensions to in, analyze the EU and the Chinese approach. Nick Chang, so, I apologize. Uh, the time is up and I'm a bit concerned about the timing of the session. If you were kind enough to try and wrap up in one okay. sentence, that would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, so in the one sentence, okay. The last uh, the sentence I want to say, the last conclusion I want to say, if we look at the four theories we just mentioned in the beginning of my presentation, okay, there's a four theories. So we, we find the, four, the first position, proposed by Milton Muna, which is not uh, really validated you know, by my study. But if you look at the second and the third uh, approach, which is more or less, more or less uh, validated in the research report. And the last one is uh, talk about minimum sovereignty space and the cooperative sovereignty. We can see there's a emerging, uh, emerging tendency towards it because there's a regional bilateral negotiation and the treaties. And the, at the international level, also there's a UN uh, uh, initiative to build up kind of the you know central uh, institution to govern the the, the cyberspace sovereignty. Thank uh, you. Yeah, thank that's you. Well. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. That is wonderful. We actually do have Rolf with us tonight, so I'm curious if he will have any comments or questions. But for us to make sure that there indeed is time to have a little bit of a conversation around these exciting topics that I also feel are very close to my heart, I'm going to swiftly hand the floor to Giovanni Di Gregorio, who will talk about digital sovereignty and platform governance, nicely linking the two topics that we have covered this evening, a European constitutional laboratory. Giovanni, we're excited to hear you again. I'm going to try and show those little posts um, showing you the, the, how we're doing on time, and I will intervene if we go a little bit over time. Giovanni, mm -hmm. into your safe hands. Go right ahead, sir. Thank you.
Thank you so much. So eight minutes starting from now. Thank you so much. Uh, it's such a pleasure to meet you all. It's always a pleasure to have the possibility, you know, to meet all of you at GigaNet every year, you know, and we hope the next year we will meet in person again. So again, this presentation very briefly, you know, we'll uh, try to put together three, at least three main components. One is the debate around digital sovereignty the other one is about uh, what is the connection with platform governance and at the very end is to look at this problem in the case of the european union so this presentation has these three dimensions let's say you know looking again at the idea of digital sovereignty the question of platform governance and how the european union in a way is reacting and planning a strategy to re in a way to deal with this intersection between again sovereignty and the governance of platforms but having said this very briefly um what is important uh, to stress to begin is that we have already mentioned that and we don't want to waste time on that really digital sovereignty has, has become a really catch-all expression you know because of course we have usually the usual idea of state sovereignty on the one hand we have the idea of global governance and of course we have even the idea of the individual autonomy increasingly the debate around digital sovereignty is about people that actually can decide about their rights and freedoms so it's not about just of course states governing a certain space or territory it's about even people asking for rights for example it's quite interesting to see also how the idea of government of sovereignty increasingly come from a bottom up pers bottom up perspective is really interesting in a way how the debate is shaping but usually when we think about sovereignty we think about the, the idea of state sovereignty just to understand but why i decide to focus on platforms in particular the intersection with this uh, in this debate because what i believe is that platforms is a very good point of connection in this case with in the debate about digital sovereignty because of course platform governance raise question about about territory, there is the traditional problem of state sovereignty, one of them for sure. Uh, but of course, so even sovereign powers exercise on private actors, for example. Then, of course, there is the problem of global governance at the same time, because these actors are able to set standards and procedures. So at the same time, raise even a question about the institutionalization of, you know, private spheres that actually are able to govern this form of spaces, you know. And there is even another, pro another problem, if we, even if we think about the idea of individual autonomy, there's also platform are important actors in shaping rights and freedoms online. So in a way, the question of platform governance governance intersect all the ideas or the primary debate around digital sovereignty, no matter whether we look at state sovereignty, global governance, or uh, let's say individual autonomy. So this is why actually I decided to look at platform governance. It's quite interesting at the intersection between uh, of all this debate. But having said, said, having said so, just, just as a premise, the question is that when we look at state sovereign, the question is, are we are states going back? You know, as also the books for Natasha Tusikov and other, other scholars, of course, have underlined. Actually, the, the answer is yes, because we have a lot of examples showing how platforms, how states have reacted to the increasing power of platforms in governing flow of information, in, in processing data and so forth. And of course, we are seeing reactions like the criminalization of platforms, especially in countries for the criminalization of hate speech and the, the spreading of hate speech or disinformation, for example, in Africa or in other places of the world. But we also see also the censorship of social media. And there are plenty of cases in the last 20 years that don't need, need to mention. And then, of course, we have even the worst case scenario that is consists of internet shutdowns. It's another problem how states are trying to govern the internet, you know. But these are the old-fashioned way to govern the internet because... In a way, state actors are not just reacting all in the same way to platform governance. And there are at least three competing models or at least approaches that are increasingly interacting at the global scale. And first of all, we have the problem of liberalism, where we don't want actually to regulate platforms. We want them actually to spread our values across the world and that it's fine. Then, of course, there is the question of protectionism that try instead to say we want to intervene in the market and say which values should we, we want to export outside our boundaries. And then, of course, there is the question of extraterritorialism. And probably some of you could ever already find some kind of new or some kind of type of states that actually fill within this, let's say, strategy to digital sovereignty. Basically, and this is just a provocation, we can say that in a way, the idea of liberalism is rooted in the US approach, the idea of protection is more rooted in the Chinese approach or Russian approach, while the extraterritorial approach is more rooted in the European approach. But this is not the case because there are a lot of intersections between these approaches. In, in the, in, on the one hand, the European approach will also be seen as a protectionist approach. You think about the AI regulation, the proposal for AI regulation. On the other hand, sometimes even 
the US approach that do not want to intervene on platform governance and times is also extraterritorial because it leaves the private sector to export their values so, uh, online and uh, um, outside their boundaries. So the question is about, we have different intersection of this approach. And we have seen, if we look at the transatlantic debate, you know, we can see exactly this point, how the union on the one end is trying to limit the platform governance. So it's reacting to the problem of these spaces governing, digital, these actors governing digital space regulating these actors and on a mix of field. On the one end, we have a form of, of course, for example, the DSA try to regulate content, but on the other end, we have a top-down regulation of AI at the same time. Why, if, if we still move at the US, we can see the other, actually is opposite approach that try instead to leave platform free, also are shielded by an idea of the first amendment that actually block and preempt state actors from introducing any kind of regulation. And so this, this actual transatlantic gaps tells a lot about what are the strategies and the models of digital sovereignty and what state actors behind digital authoritarianism, if you want to call it like that, are practical. Because it's much more than complicated than internet shutdowns. It's about constitutional values, governance, and, not, and for constitutional democracy, they, they, the match, the game, game of internet governance is precisely at this intersection. And just, just, to, just actually to, because we are almost at the end of this presentation, the European way. So the European way is the third part of this, of this presentation. Why? Because in the one end, the European way puts actually at the intersection of the dilemmas we focus, you know, on the one end. And the one end, there is the problem because on the one end, the union wants, of course, limit platform governance and try to take its step back to the path of digital sovereignty, like we see, think about even the field of cloud computing, but we have no time to talk about all these things. But of course, on the one end, we have, we see that there are some problems in which also the union is trying to deal with. For example, the problem of the values of the internal market that try to push innovation rather than protecting rights. For example, we have problems about what are the boundaries of our regulation when you want to regulate, for example, the private sector. There's another problem that involves constitutional rights, for example, in the EU. And there is also the idea of extraterritorial application because we know very well that the union has been called as global regulator, the Brussels effect and so forth. But still there are limits to the extraterritorial application of uh, rights and freedoms or rules or even governance, you know? And actually, this is actually clear when we look, and I have no time to talk with that, but we have time to discuss. I'm pretty sure that some of you are familiar with this case, but this is clear for a constitutional democracy, sometimes how it could be complicated to export constitutional values or rights, rules actually outside their boundaries. And we've seen how in these two actually decisions, the European Court has just been quite clear to say, yes, I mean, so member states could even extend their, lock, their orders of removal or the listing on a global scale, but they should take into account the framework of international human rights law. And so this is a question also for states that do not recognize so much a broader outcome, for example, a broader scope for international human rights law and do not believe in this system. So what is actually the, the effects of a, the extraterritorial dimension? But having said so, the conclusion basically, and I'm more than open to discuss with you, of course, we have multiple definitions of digital sovereignty. And this has no surprise us that we have multiple approaches to digital sovereignty. And of course, I think that the union is a very interesting case to study the intersection between digital sovereignty, platform governance, and of course, uh, global, uh, the, the regulation of platforms, but not just that. Of course, I would say thank you so much for that and we'll be more than happy to hear all your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Giovanni, for an exciting presentation. I think there's uh, a lot of food for thought in that uh, and also for being perfectly on time. With that, I hand the floor over to Anke Obendiek, who uh, kindly noted that the paper can be delivered to you per email if that is your wish. And we will hear a recap of that paper entitled Idealized Agency Investigating Digital Sovereignty in Data Governance Controversy, sort of linking the discussions we've just had or we've just heard from previous speakers. Uh, Anke, the floor is yours. As Jana has said, uh, thanks a lot um, for, for the invitation, by the way. Um, my paper is uh, available, so just drop me an email. And it's called Idealized Agency Digital Sovereignty and Data Governance Controversies. And um, what I think my, my point of departure is really similar to, to Giovanni's and that I thought this, this idea of digital sovereignty in the European context is really kind of omnipresent. So Ursula von der Leyen, Thierry Breton, all of these like high level commission officials invoke it very frequently, but we also can see that academic scholarship and think tanks have all increasingly considered this phenomenon um, of European digital sovereignty um, albeit from different um, perspectives. We've all heard about these like semiconductors um, and all of these, these issues of European investments, but I think um, 
they're, they're beyond this general idea of European common assertiveness, um, it often remains pretty vague what we're actually talking about, what digital sovereignty actually is. And I think it also ties in with, with these various definitions that, that we've heard about. And so what I was thinking, I was trying to investigate sovereignty in a, in a concrete policy area in data governance, which is the area I think where the EU arguably has the, the most leverage for kind of asserting its digital sovereignty um, due to this kind of regulatory championship position um, with the GDPR. And so I wanted to investigate what role actually digital sovereignty plays in policy controversies, how different actors invoke it, um, and what happens when different claims to, to sovereignty uh, clash. And for that, I drew on the notion of sovereignty as an idealized agency um, developed by Epstein, Lindemann, and Sending in 2018. And the concept um, establishes sovereignty as this kind of ideal that suggests an unimpeded ability to act. So what does that mean? Well, states usually have like this formal recognition as sovereign due to their status as states in the international system. The EU obviously doesn't have that. Um, but in the, in the sense they are following the same struggle because they, they both want to be recognized as having sovereignty in the sense of a capacity to act. And due to this idealized notion of, of agency that um, actors connect and associate with sovereignty, they continuously struggle to get more of it. And this leads to frustrations as uh, Epstein et al formulated, they have to fail in comparison to what actually can be achieved because there's never this unimpeded ability to act. You are due, like you are restricted to all of the the like pre-existing dynamics of power and rules that are, are there. Um, and I think um, this expresses itself in, in two dynamics where actors try to, um, to kind of claim and assert their sovereignty. And I think it's similar to what Giovanni has highlighted. On the one hand, there's this what I call sovereignty as a shield to protect the EU from kind of undue external influence of actors or values um, from third countries. And then on the other hand, you have this more external dimension um, where you have uh, sovereignty as a sword to kind of enable global change convergence around European principles. So how do I investigate this? Um, I also uh, looked at um, three legal cases. So similarly to Giovanni's, I looked at um, the Google versus Knill case, um, the Microsoft Island case, um, and the Schrems dispute about safe harbor and privacy shield. And I looked at 149 um, different policy documents, um, and I did a, a bit of a mix uh, currently at the um, with keyword and context searches uh, using MaxQDA and a more qualitative um, analysis. And all of these cases, I think, have interesting internal and external dynamics, but they are also kind of key milestones for data governance and its um, its development. So what did I find? Um, so overall, I found 342 references to sovereignty in 55 of the documents. So about one third of the documents even reference uh, sovereignty, but then um, we have 342 total references. And then I looked um, to get some context um, with this keyword in context search. Uh, I looked at the terms um, that occur before and after sovereignty. And I think what's quite interesting is that in the European discourse, it often seems as though sovereignty has become kind of detached from state sovereignty. But what we actually find is that um, these references uh, are really still very connected to traditional notions of state sovereignty, of territoriality, like sovereign interests. This is really like compared to the digital sovereignty references here, and I included the, the, the non-finding basically of European sovereignty, um, we can still see that the state is, is a very prominent reference point in these policy controversies. And I thought that was um, quite interesting. And to give another example, I wanted to briefly zoom in um, on one of the cases, which is the Microsoft Ireland case. And basically a controversy arose um, because we have extraterritorial 
or some may say extraterritorial data access by US law enforcement agencies, um, where basically um, law enforcement agencies try to get data that is stored in a different jurisdiction for their criminal investigation, and then they rely on informal cooperation with service providers. And Microsoft, thank you, um, kind of exposed this tension um, between the US, Ireland, uh, Irish and EU sovereignty um, and kind of resisted these, these claims. And then the case was argued in front of the Supreme Court. And um, we have like different actors participating as amicus curiae. And what role does sovereignty play here? We can see that sovereignty references, again, are very heavily connected to states. So Ireland is a recognized sovereign nation state. We see interference with territorial sovereignty. Interestingly, also sovereignty reference are very prominent with private actors. So Microsoft references sovereignty like crazy. And this is in contrast to um, some of the public actors. So with the US and also the European Commission, we can see that there are kind of more indirect references to domestic conduct, domestic enforceability, rather than like really concrete references um, to sovereignty. And this kind of hesitant, uh, the hesitancy is, is also in line with the outcome because the case became moot when the US adopted the US Cloud Act and kind of explicitly legalized this, this data access, um, and uh, which would have been kind of at odds if it had argued that this was a strong sovereignty concern. And then the controversy died down further because the European Commission um, adopted the electronic evidence um, regulation just uh, kind of two months after the Cloud Act was adopted. Um, so it, it didn't adopt it, it proposed it, um, and still it's like at the moment um, kind of still under uh, yeah, the whole uh, European legislative process. So we will have to wait for a while until what comes out of it. But basically this is very similar to the Cloud Act. So we can see that um, sovereignty has to kind of cut back um, compared to security cooperation interests. And just um, to conclude, so we can see that the majority of references are connected to states and territorial sovereignty. Um, and sovereignty is also, in my cases, not really a successful strategy to assert interests in the long term, at least. So if, if it's used as kind of as this more sword notion, it tends to antagonize um, other actors, for example, with the Schrems case, the Court of Justice antagonizes the EU. With CNIL, we can see a, a similar dynamic playing out. And the sovereignty as a shield dynamic is then often kind of undermined by actors within the EU who are willing to um, kind of yeah, restrict sovereignty um, to, to fight for different interests, for example, security interests. So I think in some, we shouldn't kind of overestimate the influence of rhetoric in these concrete controversies, but the normative implications, particularly of the private companies using this rhetoric are kind of unclear. So yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, looking forward to your comments. Thank you, Anne. And great, very provocative. And at the same time, a very broad scope of issues that was discussed. I, I'm, I'm thrilled to see our friends and colleagues who work on uh, digital sovereignty right now posting questions in the chat we will get to these as we progress uh, but again for the sake of time Moritz Moritz Schramm the, the floor is yours please give us an eight minutes recap of your paper on juridic governance of the internet please sir go ahead uh, my name is Moritz Schramm I'm a PhD uh, student in law at Humboldt University and right now I'm in Florence at the European University Institute and I'm going to talk about something that I call juridic governance of the internet, but most specifically of platforms. And juridic governance describes the use of judicial decision making and judicatory bodies beyond courts uh, in post state governance in general, but mainly in the governance uh, of platforms uh, in the context of this conference. And uh, just as a brief uh, disclaimer ahead, this is a work in, uh, in progress. So I'm just going to dig into a few aspects. Um, of my work, which has in principle three parts. First of all, a conceptual framework to uh, define juridic governance. Then second, a or three empirical case studies to dig into the practice of juridic governance. And third, a normative evaluation from a more theoretical perspective. Mm, today, a social media company claims to have a Supreme Court and the European Union transplants the notion of a judicatory review of administrative action to private companies. 
For example, in Article 18 of the digital of the proposed Digital Services Act, we plan something like uh, called out of court dispute settlement bodies, which basically, uh, which would basically adjudicate on the legality of content moderation as an alternative to traditional courts. And of course, Facebook has its uh, much acclaimed oversight board. These are not isolated incidents. I think that there is an adjudicatory turn in platform governance. And that means that we emulate the forms, the narratives, the institutional designs that we know to work in one context, namely the nation state, to another context. And we update these ideas to uh, kind of rectify uh, the power imbalances of the 21st century. And within juridic governance, we emulate the idea of courts and rights-based review to control the power exercised, for example, by platforms. Um, so far, we often refer to those or to such bodies either metaphorically as a Supreme Court of Facebook or uh, with non-definitions like quasi-judicial or de facto judicial, but nobody really knows what that actually means. So my empirical, actually on, on top of that, my empirical work also shows that the actors or practitioners or lawmakers who create those bodies often themselves do not really know what they are. The only thing that we know for certain is that each body on its, uh, on its own merits is an experiment. So we are witnessing a grand experiment, which I conceptualize as juridic governance. And juridic governance draws mainly from administrative theory, um, from public law, as well as from uh, legal sociology, and is inductively informed by the three case studies. And there is one defining characteristic of juridic governance, which is emulation. Juridic governance, each quasi-judicial body I describe as juridic, uh, as an example of juridic governance, emulates a court uh, in a more traditional sense, but it is specifically not a court in a traditional sense. This oversight board is not the Supreme Court. The out-of-court dispute settlement bodies are, as like quite in your face, uh, non-traditional and uh, not, uh, not typical courts, but um, Nonetheless, they use independent and impartial decision-making. They base their decision-making on rules. Um, they are functions to control, uh, control power and they issue legally binding decisions. So what we are facing is uh, a body that copies the form and fulfills the function of a court in a new context without uh, applying the traditional, uh, the traditional, uh, traditional setting. So the idea is very much to use adjudicatory bodies to control power beyond the state in the case of platforms. Mm, and with this conceptual framework, we are enabled or we have a, a better uh, starting point to analyze adjudication um, as a like governance tool um, in content moderation and jumping to the empirical case studies, I would like to share two or uh, three or four insights. And the first one is uh, coming back to what uh, Giovanni already said, there is kind of a there are two competing visions of this, the European model in the DSA and the American much more privatized model in or as epitomized by the oversight board. In the European context, we look at adjudication from a much more continental a civil law perspective as a mass phenomenon and a lot of a mass litigation of individual cases. And we are focusing on the users to advance justice for individual users. Whereas in the American context, the idea is very much more to use a few high profile cases to um, formulate general principles uh, to better the governance of, uh, in that case, Facebook, for example, in general. So we have a different focus, which again reflects different legal systems of the people who create those bodies. Then the second insight is that we are in a huge battle for legitimacy. That kind of goes back to some things that Anke said. Um, one is language. So these bodies are used and described in a way that sometimes are apt to legitimize them or in a, yeah, in a, in, to a degree that is perhaps not really warranted from a normative perspective. So for example, the oversight board is regularly called the Supreme Court. However, it still copies some elements of the US Supreme Court, but a lot of it um, departs from the original model of Supreme Court. So we really have to be careful and conceptually very concise in how to how to describe those bodies. And then second, from a more theoretical um, point of view, we are witnessing how to a, a redefinition of the balance between adjudicatory ex post control of how rules are enforced. I think you 
how rules are enforced, which is something that juridic governance can offer. So we can use adjudicatory bodies or judicial decision making to control um, basically administrative or executive actions. But on the other hand, we also see how this model of ex post control is um, kind of emerges as a discursive argument against more participatory, more democratic influence over the creation of rules in the first place. So we have to be uh, remain vigilant here as to how this plays out. And coming to my last and concluding point, that sociology in context really matter. Um, for once, this is so far a project by, by Western lawyers, for Western lawyers. Most of the people who invent this are either Ivy League educated Americans or people sitting or working for the European Commission. It remains largely silent on the global south dimension, for example. And second, many, many ideas we perceive as entirely novel and completely new are in fact not so new. Um, most of the ideas have been around and before uh, the context of, even the context of the internet, private governance as well is something we witnessed before uh, the, the modern nation state even. And we should therefore be not only looking in the future, but also to the past to better understand what ideas and uh, concepts are actually um, re not reinvented, but like emulated and uh, revamped in the context of the internet. And coming to my concluding remark, at the end of the day, we kind of see that on the one hand, emulating courts or the internet works as it advances a certain degree of normative stability. I don't want to use the term rule of law, but it stabilizes how normative decisions are made on what normative basis. Mm, but on the other hand, it might simulate simultaneously stall efforts to de democratize the rulemaking uh, and platform governance because it's kind of a, an alternative mechanism to more participatory means of creating those norms that are basically the basis of uh, adjudicating on. Um, yeah, thank you very, very much. I would love to stay in touch and discuss uh, my, my work with you. Thank you. And I'm thank you, Maurice. This comments. is really in depth and exciting, and I could think of no better forum for you to present that research, even if uh, it is still at an early stage than the GigaNet Symposium. So th thank you very much for, for putting this paper forward. I'm looking forward to the comments and the discussions. Do feel free to use the chat. We will try to address these questions as they come forward. Last but not least, Rachel Halvey with the Developing Order Through Socialization, uh, China's Ideological Persuasion to build a rule-based order for cyberspace. It seems only appropriate to have this paper as the last one presented in this panel, as it does indeed seem to capture most of the issues other panelists have touched upon. With that, confidently, the uh, floor uh, is handed over to you, Rachel. Go right ahead. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to be here with so many excellent papers and scholars presenting work on digital sovereignty. I'd like to join this panel by offering some insights on the development of order um, and how China is using sovereignty to inspire the development of a rules-based order. And so to begin, um, governments are increasingly focused on the need to develop rules for cybersecurity. And recent attacks have made this all the more salient as the public really feels the effects of cyber attacks in the United States. The attack on the colonial pipeline led to long delays. And this has led governments to organize themselves um, to develop rules, norms, and principles. This has been ongoing for over two decades, uh, occurring both within the United Nations first committee meetings uh, through the group of governmental experts, um, as well as a recent process within the United Nations open-ended working group, um, both of which recently concluded um, and the OEWG is due for another round. And within these forums, governments are demanding clear rules and standards. They're demanding collaboration, uh, ways to build confidence and capacity. However, they're also debating um, the standards and the rules that should guide uh, international relations. So there are two key debates around international law. 
Uh, first, governments are debating the applicability of existing bodies of law to new frontiers. Um, some governments are arguing that international law should simply apply uh, to new frontiers, whereas other governments are contesting this and arguing uh, that it would be uh, unwise to apply uh, existing bodies of law. And some governments even argue that it would be dangerous. And this is puzzling for theories of international relations as we typically tend to think that there can be some efficiency from drawing from previous agreements um, and applying those to new forms of cooperation. There's also unexpected preferences for creating treaties. Um, we see some governments uh, that are calling for voluntary principles for confidence building measures. And then we see other governments that are loudly calling for binding rules for developing a new legal instrument. And these are largely authoritarian states. Um, so within the forums, you see Egypt, Syria, Iran calling for these binding rules. Um, and this also cuts against our expectations within international relations, um, as we typically tend to think of liberal states as preferring a zone of law and authoritarian states preferring um, codes of conduct, soft law, um, legal arrangements that are not going to be binding in nature. So my research questions are twofold. I focus on which governments are likely to contest the application of international law to new frontiers. And I'm also seeking to explain why some governments, especially authoritarian states, um, prefer hard law and binding legal rules. So I focus on the role of China um, and China's use of socialization and persuasion. Um, so I build out a theory of how China is using ideology in particular to persuade a group of governments um, to support a rules-based order in cyberspace. Um, and so I argue that given how China uses ideology to persuade um, governments that are typically most likely to support uh, a status ideology in other areas of international relations um, are likely to add advocate for change in the status quo in cyberspace. And so I develop a theory of ideological persuasion. Uh, ideology in international relations uh, generally focuses on the differences between uh, liberal ideology that uh, focuses on the rights of individuals, as well as the role of markets to allocate resources against a status ideology um, that privileges the role of governments. Um, and so my question then is how do governments know that institutions will support their preferences uh, in new frontiers? We typically then tend to think of liberal international law or liberal international organizations, um, but how do governments know that their preferences will be supported in particular forms of organization? And so I argue that persuasion um, is a way that uh, China can indicate which types of rules and which types of legal design uh, will be supporting preferences. So there is one form of persuasion which focuses on framing the benefits uh, and the consequences, making certain ideas salient, uh, as well as a, another type of persuasion that focuses on linking to existing concepts and frame alignment. And so China uses an ideological persuasion to indicate that a status ideology will be supported in a highly um, binding and legalized order. So China links with Westphalian norms and principles, um, particularly sovereignty, um, the inf International Code of Conduct for Information Security argues that governments are the uh, dominant authority for uh, information and communications technology. China also links with the United Nations Charter to emphasize principles of non-interference in domestic affairs. China also frames the benefits and consequences for states of particular legal arrangements, um, arguing that international law will strengthen the role of governments um, and also arguing that existing rules will present security challenges. So framing uh, the need to collaborate in ways that are within the DNA of all modern states, which is sovereignty and security. 
So I will briefly present uh, evidence of ideological coalitions. I'm happy to uh, take to explain more in the Q&A. But as we see uh, the need to mobilize um, an ideological coalition, uh, we can first look at the development of new processes. The open-ended working group um, really is a new way to collaborate. Um, and China and Russia frame this as um, integrating states and being something that would be very state-centric and state-forward, uh, given that it's the first time that all 192 members of the United Nations could participate. And so my initial analysis using a measure of ideology is that um, governments that align with China, uh, ideologically speaking, are uh, likely to support the need to develop uh, new processes. I also look at government statements within the open-ended working group and those that are calling for the development of hard law and binding rules and treaties. And I do find uh, support there as well for an ideological coalition. Uh, so I appreciate any uh, feedback or comments that you would like to share. Uh, and I look forward to the discussions in the Q&A. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Rachel. That is indeed inspiring. There seems to be an overarching theme of, regardless of where the policy is being developed, there being a shared perspective on working further on what we have. So your parallels between the EU and China are much appreciated, especially in this international community. Uh, Claudio, straight into your hands for eight minutes of comments on all of these exciting papers. I don't know how you're going to do it, my friend, but I have full confidence. Please uh, try to take us through these papers with your comments. I also encourage our participants, our presenters, to look into the chat. And when you will be responding to Claudio's comments, if you could integrate the questions that pop up into the chat, that would be wonderful. Claudio, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, Fiona. A pleasure to, to be with you again. A, a pleasure to see and uh, uh, see some fa familiar names and faces here. Uh, it's a re real challenge. Thank you very much, Roxana, for, for the invitation to be discussing with you the papers for Giganet again for the, for, the, for the second year in a row where we couldn't uh, meet together. And, and, and the coffee here uh, is extremely, I miss the coffee a lot because you, you have done a kind of uh, magic steps in trying to summarize fascinating themes, very pressing themes, because these are the themes, and I'm going to stress that a lot, these are the themes that are going to shape our discussion about how the, uh, the, how the, the, the digital space develops from now on. They are shaping already. They're very pressing uh, questions. You can hardly present uh, other than aspects, main aspects of your work in this eight minutes, and I could not explore them uh, other than in a coffee in a longer time. Uh, with you, but uh, to, to give you a, a, a quick glance on, on how uh, delicate and sensitive these themes are, I think the, the oldest reference to sovereignty in a digital realm that I found in all the papers was Team Wu's from 1997. While we discuss uh, sovereignty from a general perspective for centuries, these are the most uh, 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 recent references. Most of them are, are very close ones. So what it means to me, uh, it shows that uh, if we take a, a traditional sovereignty in consideration, we usually have a stable environment with points of controversy. And that is situation is absolutely uh, overturned when we discuss a, a sovereignty in a digital realm. We have a, a world of uh, instability, in, uh, even recognizing that all those notions in, in different in the different papers that you connect them, all of them apply, but we have much more points of con controversy than we can uh, determine. Uh, and another connection is still a general one. We, we have uh, uh, for, from last year or 2020, I think this years inside have uh, damaged our notion of time, but we have a, a recent experience in the, from the Harvard Berkman Klein on the notion of digital self-determination. It was a wonderful research sprint that break, brought out very interesting points. It was a different perspective, a different approach, but definitely connecting to what you uh, bring here. So in specifics, not to abuse my invitation here as a discussion and to let you have other questions, to uh, Yik Chan uh, and, and Kelly, uh, I, I, I've seen that you were, you were uh, uh, highlighting not the absence, but the preference of uh, non-binding uh, norms 
from a European perspective. And I'd like to, to, if you can, if you relate to that, to Mr. Emmanuel Macron's opening speech at IGF 2000 and uh, lost notion of time, 18, 19, 18, IGF 2018, of the with or against you. Right? I, I don't think there is a point, I, I do not see binding norms being developed and, and, and enforced right now, but that was a clear message. And it was even a clearer message when we take uh, that it was the, let's say the, to that date, it was the most important head of state that attended and made a, 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 a pressing and a, a, a solid speech on an IGF that does not point to the absolute preference of non-binding norms from the UN and the Western uh, countries uh, in general. And also for you and for Rachel, I think you have very interesting uh, insights and aspects and you also have a, a, a very interesting case in which, from which to draw conclusions now, which is the, the app apparent clash, I'm not sure if it is a clash, from the EU approach on regulating AI and from the Chinese uh, uh, recommend, uh, algorithmic recommendation systems uh, uh, piece or initiative. I think that, that might be an interesting case study from which to apply your frameworks and maybe uh, draw some conclusion out of there. Uh, for uh, for Giovanni, uh, with the discussion about constitutionalism, I think it's it's, it's still something to be uh, taken uh, very seriously from for, for the next years. I see uh, Giovanni the, that when you m mention the forms of reaction from governments, you do not mention or you do not highlight or list cooperation as one of them. Uh, you mention it in your paper, you, you mentioned it again in the presentation, but you do not explore it as a form of reaction. And my question is, is it because you do not believe in it uh, or uh, it's not, it just do not, does not have the status importance enough to, be, to become a status of one of your categories? And if you, don't, if you do not believe it, which is I'm, what I'm tended to think, what factors do you think contribute to cooperation not being taken into consideration as a form of reaction uh, for governments? I've taken a couple of notes about Anke's uh, very interesting and insightful uh, question and, and data, uh, but you, you, you mentioned as a uh, uh, sovereignty as a sword or a shield, you brought us the fact that this notion is rather invoked, but that's very interesting data, uh, rather invoked by private agents than by states. Uh, and if you had the time to, to uh, go inside the data to see if when private companies invoke that, do they invoke a, a more as a sword or as, or as a shield? Uh, that is a, the, something I would like to see if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. And from Moritz, the, the idea of juridic governance also fascinates me. I think we have a lot to explore upon that. And you, I, I had my notes here and you mentioned in the presentation that most of this discussion was being taken from, uh, as you said, Western, uh, West, a Western mindset. I think there's a little bit more to that, Moritz. It's not only Western, it's a, a global North mindset for the kind of, of acting of a judicial system, because there's, there's a global South perspective on that also. Uh, and that makes us uh, focus on competing uh, enforcement models and, and conflict resolution cultures. Not all countries, mainly in the global south, has a, have a culture of solving their conflicts without trusting in the judiciary system. And that's, that poses a hard challenge uh, to, to your idea. Uh, I would like to see if you see, uh, to ask if you see traditional, traditional judicial bodies exercising some kind of influence in an ideal model of juridic governance, or if they're simply out of the game altogether. Uh, and one last but very interesting point, it's not very digital, but it's uh, if we are taking your model as say as to evolve as a global solution, uh, there's currently a very pressing issue about legitimacy, not of the judicial system as such, as one uh, state function, but the judicial profile of court mem members, which is not the same everywhere again. We have very different traditions of fulfilling judicial, uh, jurisdictional functions. And uh, I'd like to see if you can elaborate a little bit, if, if you see that as posing a challenge to your very interesting model. I hope I have kept my time, Yvonne, and thank you very much again for the invitation and this opportunity to, to share these fascinating articles with you. Thank you.
you did great on time, Claudio, but it, you did even better on content. Thank you very much. That was a very thorough recap. With that, I'm going to hand the floor back to our speakers. So just uh, um, emulating the practice I learned from Courtney, I think that worked well. Thank you very much for taking the lead then. Um, and I'm going to give each of our speakers, of our presenters, four minutes, uh, starting from the last to the first, so to speak. This should allow us to leave a few more minutes for comments or questions from the audience, which is always the most exciting part, uh, whether you're participating or presenting. So with that, I'm going to hand the floor back to Rachel for a four minute intervention. I won't show you those little posters this time, but I'm certain we can stick to the time. So Rachel, the floor is yours. Go right ahead. Oh, sure. Thank you so much for your feedback. Um, it was really great to hear more of your suggestions. Um, my intervention can be quite short to save uh, time for the others, but I did wonder if you could uh, potentially drop into the chat uh, what you were mentioning in terms of the case that would be a really great thing uh, for those of us who are focused on China. Uh, I, I know that there's a presentation that's going to happen here at the IGF about um, algorithmic rules, but I, I was wondering if that's what you're referring to or uh, something broader. So uh, that would be uh, fantastic. I'll drop it here. It, it's actually the Chinese recommendation, uh, Chinese algorithmic recommendation systems. It's an initiative. I think Yi Chan can, can uh, maybe elaborate a little a little bit on that yes i think there's a recent regulation you know proposed by the cac the central cyberspace administration and basically they say the uh when the platform social media platform using the algorithm they have to fulfill some you know responsibility for example they have to be transparent they have to be account accountable to the user and they have to disclose the the how the algorithm works to keep uh, uh, transparency and also they they should allow the company the platform should allow user to change the uh, algorithm you know to fit their interests so there's a lot of very detailed measures but uh, the main question is how do they implement it so there's a lot of question about uh, how do they implement all these requirements i think that's a key issue implementation and enforcement and is there also um mobilization for international law or is this mainly a domestic um type of policy. I think this is mainly about to uh, apply to the platform domestically. As, as I said, you know, they try to provoke or propose the international convention at the, at the UN level, but uh, that hasn't been success. I think recently they did uh, propose a uh, past the solution in the first committee of the UN, maybe you, you heard in the November two weeks ago, but this is more about arm control but not about uh, ICT, but this is the first uh, uh, international resolution passed, proposed by the China and it's passed in the UN. But re uh, the rest of attempts didn't su succeed. Thank you, I'll uh, yield the floor for others. Thank you very much, Rachel, for um, allowing this uh, space to serve for a conversation. I think it's a very worthwhile one. I also point your attention to the comment in the chat, which I think is, uh, uh, a great summary of the discussion we're having here from Mark, Mark Raymond, who clearly emphasizes that states are being forever more proactive. And I believe that the research that was presented in this session confirms that statement. So thank you very much for sharing your thoughts there. Uh, and again, following that order, uh, I'm going to give the floor to Moritz if you have any comments or follow up uh, questions uh, potentially to other panelists or summaries you would like to share. We would love to hear from you. Moritz, the floor is yours. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much, all of you, especially uh, to Claudia for, for those comments. I'd like to, to pick up on something that Giovanni and Anke brought up. And I think that's really like not from a legal, but like more from a socio scientific perspective, really important that we specifically look into the value of concepts and the value of words that are potentially legitimizing when we talk about something. So what is the descriptive um, added value of calling something or describing something um, with a term that inherently carries at least in a or global north or western uh, context a certain degree of legitimacy such as for example um, sovereignty I mean also legitimacy maybe but certainly kind of strength but uh, yeah I mean we talked about this in digital constitutionalism and so on so that I think I really like this uh, how you um, dissected those notions or uh, in Anka's case even like looked into the the the, the keywords and uh, semantic context I think that's super interesting and really really important to keep in mind 
Um, coming to Claudio's uh, comment, your first remark was about like the, the so idea of juridic governance as a global north mindset, and I absolutely agree. I mean, it builds from a sociological perspective on on Teubner's work on on juridification, which of course only focuses on 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 Western European and North American uh, societies. I don't think that there is a, a universalist um, um, truth in in that concept, but um, at least for global north uh, countries, I think that if we look at what type of governance beyond the state, and it does not even have to be the internet, it can even be uh, in the European Union, we see similar tendencies, in fact, um, then there is a certain meta trend or meta narrative that bases the legitimacy of institutional power on two things, that is courts, and that is rights. Since the 1970s or 80s, we conceptualized so many issues as issues of rights, and we achieved so much sociopolitical uh, progress on, in the courtroom, basically, from anti-discrimination law to social justice in the United States. That was, to a large extent, um, achieved by in the courtroom. And therefore, it is only, from a sociological perspective, completely almost seems natural that we say, ah, okay, when we have a problem in, in the governance of platforms, okay, let's attach a court to it. So my, my concept of juridic governance, therefore, is really very much descriptive. It's descriptive analytical. I want to explain what I see, make sense of those quasi-judicial bodies that I see, and try to contextualize them in the broader context of juridification, which means like, that we understand more and more issues as an issue of rights, and judicialization, which means that those rights are enforced by courts. I think this explains uh, the Western part of it. Second, does this um, make, this of course does not apply um, to, to, to the global South conflicts. And in fact, in my empirical section, I talked to some activists uh, who worked with a lot of uh, with Middle Eastern NGOs or South American NGOs. And they always say, ah, this oversight board, for example, it's, it's what, what for? We, we don't, it, it's a project by Western lawyers for Western lawyers. And that, that is certainly true, but at the end of the day, um, those are the people who decide, at least in those uh, companies. So yeah, this critique is absolutely important. And I, I try to, maybe I, perhaps I should make it even bigger in the project, but I think it's um, a critique inherent in, in how problematic <laughs> some parts of our governance uh, are structured. And this is just a manifestation of inherent structural um, yeah, problems we have. Then very briefly to the traditional role of courts, I think that triggers a, uh, um, like a, um, a, a graded response because on the one hand, I think this is a really, really big challenge for traditional courts because of course it's not a, from a strictly legal perspective, it's not um, that the oversight board or the DSA outrules courts. But in practice, it will be cheaper, it's um, easier accessible, and there will be certainly more expertise, at least in some cases. So I think the problem of stabilizing a normative order completely outside of the scope of some form of democratic public authority is definitely there. And it's definitely something I see actually even closer than the horizon, basically. And then second, I think the even more important role of traditional courts is a reflexive one, namely that it means, or that it works as a paragon um, that is emulated. So the, 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 this oversight board, they, they just copycat models we know from US constitutional law. The DSA copycats models we know from US uh, European administrative law. And that, again, has positive aspects because these models work, but has also negative aspects because it legitimizes, uh, in fact, undemocratic uh, actor. And then very briefly to the last point, the judicial concept of court members. Um, again, uh, EU-US divide in the United States, um, they, <laughs> one of the most, I, I think the important thing about the independence of the oversight board is that it has very high profile members who have an institutional interest in being independent. There is um, like a professor at Columbia Law School um, 
those are the people who have the stamina and 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 the the, the ego, frankly, um, to be independent of Facebook. In the EU, where we don't have um, such a yeah, politicized uh, personalities of judges, I mean, think of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for example, or Antonin Scalia. Um, nobody talks about the judges in in, our, in the DSA. There is not even a proper procedure how to select them. And with this, I conclude. Thank you very much. Uh, Moritz, I'm, I'm smiling because, uh, well, the IGF is hosted in Poland and Polish, and there's this huge debate about constitutional tribunal judges, and there is a huge political context to it. So we're following the US from what you're saying, which might be the silver lining that I'm struggling to see. With that, I'm going to hand the floor over to Anke. I'm going to encourage you to try and stick to the time just to give us a little bit more room for feedback. We're doing all right on time, I think, but uh, uh, Anke, the four minutes is granted. If you go a little bit over that, that is also fine. Uh, we have two more speakers. Anke, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will keep it short. Um, thanks, first of all, to to Claudio, of course, for um, for the comments and uh, to everyone else for for listening. Um, yeah, I think uh, whether so. So your question was kind of headed in this direction of um, what it, when we see private actors um, kind of invoking sovereignty, do we see it more as as a as a sword or as a shield um, dynamic? And I was uh, I was very happy when I read uh, Moritz's paper because it it has this concept of emulation. And I do have that in a different paper as well, because I think it's so, so interesting that we can see all of these private actors referring, like emulating public discourse, like public in, in a kind of state way, public discourse, um, and using terms such as sovereignty that are usually so so much associated um, with, with the state. And I think that's a really interesting phenomenon. And I think mainly what we see is that they use sovereignty as a shield to kind of limit the, the influence of, of stuff that they don't like in, in specific uh, jurisdictions. So um, in, the, in the CNIL case, for example, you can see that Google warns very specifically about um, applying this European standards outside of Europe. And what you can see like, is this kind of interesting dynamic. If the rule is not yet in place, and if there is maybe a chance to have like softer rules on a global level, then we can see, OK, we can spread the standard throughout the world. But if you have a very strict standard in one jurisdiction, such as the, the right to um, be delisted or the right to be forgotten in the EU, then they really want to limit this to, to this specific um, jurisdiction. And then they, they tend to invoke these sovereignty as a shield um, justifications to kind of limit the, the spread um, to other jurisdictions and, and kind of try to highlight the potential um, harm that, that might be inflicted on other jurisdictions. And they point to and this kind of regulatory race to the bottom. So basically, the whole dynamic in the in the in the right to be forgotten case is that we would all see Iran's or whatever uh, standards um, of an authoritarian country apply to everything, and then they use it as this kind of like protective idea. But um, yeah, as I said, like sometimes when when the rules are not yet in place, then it's this idea like have a softer uh, rule in in place for for everyone, and that I think is um, is quite an interesting dynamic. Um, I think to to Mark's point, very briefly, um, yeah, I think it it is certainly um, that kind of global debates are consequential, like more consequential than perhaps when we have like compared this to the discussions at the IGF. Um, but I, I think it's it's still important to kind of look at these dynamic and kind of critically investigate them, because I think in data governance, you can really see that there's a lot of this kind of self undermining dynamics also happening, um, where the EU is talking a lot about sovereignty, but then particularly in all kinds of security issues is then deciding again and again to, okay, we need to include companies such as Palantir uh, or Amazon in our Gaia X, like European cloud efforts. And then you, you can see that this is, I think is still important um, dynamic that we should uh, pay attention to how this is kind of self undermining. And this is not an, a new argument, um, but but I think it's, it's a dynamic that we should um, kind of 
critically investigate when, when looking at all of this very shiny um, digital sovereignty to rhetoric coming, to, coming from the European Commission. But um, yeah, I will finish here and thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anke. Uh, both Giovanni and Vik Chan, our next speakers, have received a few questions in the comments. I would encourage you guys to try and address these uh, again, uh, keeping in mind uh, the, the time limits that we do have here. Uh, Giovanni, the floor is yours. Please kindly try to address the comments uh, from uh, our discussant and optionally as well the questions that you have received in the chat. Thanks. I will be a really quick promise. So first of all, uh, the, the comment, the most relevant comment was about why I didn't talk about cooperation between platform and governance and government. Actually, it was one of the uh, it was one of the points that I usually address in my research, and it's quite interesting, I think. It's the problem is that we have eight minutes, you know, sorry for that. You know, so we, know, we have not always the right time to address properly all these questions, but definitely that is one of the concern, the main concern about when governments cooperate with platforms in terms of what, what how public values are in a way. I, in a way, there is this process of hybridization of public values when the governments interact with private actors, but there is even the opposite to that. You know, there are even private values, of course, interacting with governments. So this is, of course, one of the big source of concern. And I see, in a way, the co-regulatory framework in the future will be the rule. They will be the road. So I do not actually... I see actually that there will be space for cooperation. The question is that the problem is about what are the values driving um, driving this cooperation? Because if we take one model based on neoliberal values, this could lead to some invisible handshake that some scholars have already underlined. But if we move to different frameworks like the European one, this could lead, for example, to a co-regulatory system, rather in other frameworks could lead to a form of uh, predominance of one actor over the other. So it, this depends because it's even a relationship of power. So it's definitely worth researching and focusing more in the, in the research. So thanks for that comment, it's been really relevant. And so Rachel, uh, Rachel, no, no, the, the, the idea of digital constitution and digital sovereignty that is related to just platform governance. So the, the idea, it's more kind of a provocation also in the paper saying that actually one of the reasons why we can identify the European model, it is because it's a kind of reaction to platform governance. And so we can see and the European model reacting to this issue, to these forms of powers on, on the global scale, of course, trying to extend constitutional values or a form of governance towards the private sector. But this is not the only case. So it's not the only one because we have also other examples as you, the one you mentioned that also, also competition law is a big is a big puzzle of the internal market. But part of my, of my understanding of my research underlines that actually competition law or other measures actually have failed, you know, to make their promises because of course they have actually failed to consider the role of constitutionalism, especially when we focus on constitutional Democracy. This probably this this debate will not apply when we focus on other sides of the world for sure, where there is not this constitutional culture for sure. But it's for sure I totally agree with you about the idea that digital constitutionalism and also sovereignty is much more than just reacting to platform governance. So thank you for that question. And then on Blaine, there is about the question about uh, the three the classification between liberalism and uh, extraterritorialism and uh, protectionism. Yes, of course, it could be see also a form of dominance, of course, or hegemony. And this has also been stressed, especially when we focus on the global South, even if you do not like so much use of this expression, uh, especially when we focus on Africa, for example, Latin America, we can see how uh, this form of hegemony actually are not always there, but there are other dynamics going, do going on, especially when platforms are involved. And this has been addressed by different scholars thinking about the idea of digital the digital colonialism and so forth. So, but we have no time to talk about that. So, but this is relevant. It's a question of label. I try to use those labels, but feel free to use yours for sure. Um, and then of course, uh, there is another question by Rolf. Thank you so much. So it's about the role of private actors international as uh, in the international scene. And of course this is relevant. I'm not the first one of talking about the role of private actors in international law and their responsibility. We have a framework of business human rights. The question is about whether these actors are sovereign or increasingly playing the role of sovereign authority. Is if you look at the, the definition of state sovereignty, definitely these private actors are not sovereign in a way, you know? The problem is that what kind of definition we take of sovereignty, in a way, probably these actors are taking a form of sovereignty if you look at the debate of global governance, but not so sure when we look at the issue of state governance, especially when there are some papers that try to look at Facebook as a quasi-state. So, I mean, there are quasi 
governance, fu- so governmental function, but not really as a state, you know, or at least it's not still the case, probably in the future, why not? So uh, this is actually the questions that, that, that actually were raised in the chat. And of course, if you have any other question, of course, you know, we can keep in touch by email, social media, whatever, you know, so I'm more than happy to answer all your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Indeed, I do feel that we have provided more food for thought that this format would allow us to digest. So I would encourage everyone not just to join the business meeting later, but to engage individually with the authors whose work is closest to what you're doing. Speaking of which, Ik Chan, I don't want to say famous last words, but you've received quite a few questions and China has been very high on the agenda. Every speaker basically refer to the work that's going on there. So, so I would love to hear from you the feedback to Claudia's comments, but also feedback to the questions and the discussion as it has unfolded during the panel. Please, e, go ahead. Yes, yeah, thank you, Gerardi. Uh, and for the questions, for the discussions, questions, actually, I think uh, I just want to say, you know, we, we see two different uh, tendencies uh, between the EU and China, but uh, in the end, they converge together uh, and uh, arrive at the same destination, which is unfortunate, you know. So basically, uh, China start with the, uh, as I said, let's say in uh, uh, weak and strong uh, data sovereignty. So China start with the uh, strong sovereignty, uh, strong data sovereignty, which means that they put a security, national security, as a core concern in the beginning in their regulation or in terms of governance of data. So that's therefore they have data security law, you know, all this law. And then they move towards the weak sovereignty. Data sovereignty means to protect individual rights. So they have a PPI, Personal Protection Information Protection Act, which is the last act they have after all this data security law or national security law. But if you look at the EU, they have a reverse order. You know, they have the GDPR first. Then they have a governance, data governance act, and they have a, a Z7 uh, trade principle, the digital trade principle, which is uh, governing the free flow of the data between this Z7 and the European uh, uh, Union. So basically, they are moving from the individual right to the data security, national security. But in the end, they're all about development, individual right, and the security. So that's the convergence we have at the moment. And uh, so, the, so this is the main difference. Uh, the start from different uh, uh, point, but they converge in the, in the end. But this is mainly because of the concern of the geopolitical struggling, and also the, you know, the relationship with the America and with China. So because of this, so European has to take the more protective uh, approach towards it is digital sovereignty or data sovereignty, whatever. But where China and also have to also you know take all this inter- international struggling into the account and also the other things about why china or other countries like russian or the developing country they want to have a binding international law uh, rules it's because the existing laws you know many of them they didn't participate in drafting for example budapest convention you know budapest convention is a european convention but it has been set up by many countries like japan you know canada or Australia, but uh, they want to become, they want this uh, Budapest Convention become an international uh, law. Uh, but uh, China and Russia refused to cite because they said we didn't participate in drafting it. Okay, so that's why, that's why they continue to talk about like uh, international dimension of the sovereignty, like uh, equality, you know, non intervention, all these things, because they want to have a new rules which they have been participate in drafting it. And where the EU and America wants to have a existing or maintain because they draft it. So that's the difference, you know, this is a power struggling. And, uh, uh, but uh, from the, my point of view, uh, it's very difficult to achieve any international conventions, uh, even the Russian propose it, you know. So in the end, maybe it's still, there's an alternative between the, uh, you know, uh, norms or rules. And uh, so the UN is taking up the role, says we want to have a, a, a more enhanced multilateral uh, model, which means not, not only because the UN was the multi, uh, multilateral organization, but they want to have an enhanced multilateral model, which means they also have the uh, civil society and the company to participate in the rulemaking. So, in the, so, so UN wants to take the central role. 
So in the end, we may see an international order which has the UN as a central institution, but we have a lot of the regional agreement, like the G7, the US, the EU agreement, Japan agreement, or whatever, you know, Asia, Pacific, they have regional agreements. So we have UN and regional agreement, and in the end, we also have some voluntary initiative, you know, proposed by the international organizations or NGOs. So that's my take of the what will happen in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chan. This is inspiring. I, I, I'm certain we could have an entire panel just to carry on this discussion. I see a few comments in the chat. Thank you, Jamal, and thank you, Mark, for this, uh, as Jamal puts it, more food for thought. This is definitely a topic we can further explore and the role of international law and all of this. Is, uh, I, I welcome it. I embrace it with all my heart, but uh, I, it is a significant one. And we haven't even touched on the technical governance of even internet in this session. Um, Claudia, I'm curious if you have any summaries for this intense debate? If you could help me out, that would be I most do. welcome. Please Thank go ahead. Very, Thank you very much again, Joanna, for, for conducting this awesome panel and for Roxana again for the invitation. Uh, Jamal, I think that that is actually what we're doing here, right? There's no, we're, we're certainly not going to get a response in 90 minutes of discussing the, the legal and social mechanisms through which we're going to shape the future of the digital environment. And that was a wonderful opportunity. So I'd like to highlight that to all the discussants and to all the, the, the interested ones here. Uh, our notions, our traditional notions of sovereignty and, and, and uh, interrelation, uh, these kinds of interrelations have worked. Have, they have not been perfect, but have, they have taken us uh, far enough, let's say. These rules and these concepts are not adequate, are not absolutely adequate to the environment that we're developing now. So these kinds of discussion that we're having here, uh, we're not, uh, uh, there's no fantasy or there's no illusion that we're going to implement the greatest models in spite of all the political and power tensions that you mentioned here. There's no illusion of that happening. But since it is a model that no one has built before, it's very important to hear interesting insights and, and, and solid research on that. I think that's the way we're going to be taken ahead uh, in a solid direction, Joanna. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I think that is the, the best takeaway. Let's just uh, do our share of the work, do our research, make sure that it's valid and that we get a platform like this one to discuss it further. Again, I, I think the takeaway is we just need more GigaNet Symposia, isn't it? We just need to have a dedicated one at least three times a year to discuss the details of this. With that, I'm going to try and wrap up. Thank you, everyone. Please do feel free to reach out to the panelists directly if you have comments or questions. GigaNet offers this unique opportunity to meet folks that work, uh, work on things that you are working on, but they have a completely different perspective on it. That's what I've always found so tremendously appealing. Thank you to our presenters today. Uh, and thank you to, to Roxana, Dima, the whole program committee. You guys have put together an exciting program and you have managed to arrange the panelists or the papers in such a way that my job has been tremendously easy. It was basically just timekeeping and summarizing all of those brilliant presentations. So with that, I'm going to wrap us up for this session. The next session is going to start at uh, well, depending on where you are, but I'm going to use Katowice and Wuch time, so the CET, uh, a quarter past five. Do enjoy your short break and make sure you join us for the business meeting if there are any pending issues that you would like to discuss on Zoom or just join us for the next GigaNet Symposium that will hopefully happen face to face. Keep safe, everyone. Keep, keep washing those hands and uh, let us meet again face to face at another GigaNet Symposium. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure as always. Stay safe. The meeting, the session is adjourned. <laughs>